It's fair to say that there have been occasions when we've screwed up while playing video games. And then, uh -huh. oh no, I jumped down. Oh no! <laughs> oh no! I did not oh, mean to no. do that. Oh good, an illustrative clip there. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Oh my god! Another clip, just to really underline the point. Oh no! Oh, no. Popping in. Okay, oh. that's fine. Oh, that's <laughs> you 3, yeah. that's well, the biggest crash I've ever seen. That's the seen. biggest so crash yet. Damage, yeah. It's a new record, oh. fellas. Are you done? They're shaking their head. The important thing, though, is that while we often mess up while playing games, getting ourselves into positions where we would be permanently screwed, there are certain video games that know exactly what we're like and go out of their way to save us from ourselves and prevent us from making the game unwinnable. Thanks, games. It's more than we deserve. Here are six such games that took pity on us terrible gamers. Enjoy, and boy, spoilers ahead for the following games. from which she never awakens. He has been nurtured by that nightmare, waiting for the day to be born. At the very end of Silent Hill, you face the final boss known as the Incubus, a manifestation of the old god worshipped by, surprise, Silent Hill's local cult. What the? And yes, before you ask, it is a kind of gigantic, winged, horned, naked, goat-looking demon that is accompanied by a constant, tortured, electronic screaming. How did you guess? But what if all the electronic screaming and goat demons were just a front and actually Silent Hill is on your side and wants what's best for you? Turns out that that might actually be the case, as we can see from what happens if you arrive at this final Silent Hill boss fight, having completely run out of ammo because, say, you used it all up on panicky blind firing into the fog because you heard some radio static. To pick a random example. Here's when Silent Hill rolls its eyes, throws its hands up in despair and says, fine, I'll help you out. Because if you do show up to this final showdown without any way of actually fighting the boss, Silent Hill will silently kill off its final boss for you because apparently it has to do everything around here. <laughs> it's okay, Silent Hill. I won't tell anyone if you don't. The first Half-Life game featured absolutely loads of guns for mild-mannered scientist Gordon Freeman to get his hands on, ranging from pistols to shotguns to a sort of beehive glove. Deeply unpleasant. Thankfully, when Half-Life 2 rolled around, it also brought with it the Gravity Gun, an incredibly useful bit of environment-manipulating kit that basically made all other weapons obsolete, meaning you didn't have to deal with putting your hands in beehives or figure out what the hell was going on with snarks anymore. Do... do I need to feed it? Now, the gravity gun is super useful, no doubt, but there are some things it can't do, like for example, shoot a padlock, a situation that arises in the low-life chapter of Half-Life 2 Episode 1, where Gordon falls through a vent into a room secured with a padlocked gate. Luckily for you, this room also contains a few weapons, which you can grab and use to shoot the padlock off the gate so you can be on your merry way. But what happens if you miss your shot 58 times? Or use up all your ammo shooting smiley faces into the wall? What then? Well, in this incredibly specific instance, where you've managed to trap yourself for all eternity in a storage room because you couldn't shoot a padlock off a door, Half-Life 2 Episode 1 will save you from yourself by having the padlock magically pop open, freeing you from this prison of your own creation. It's more than we deserve, but I'll take it. I'll take that, Hernandez. Hey, that's my paper, man. That's money. This is drug money. It's my money, man. Hey, don't worry about it. I'll fill it out later. <sighs> Welcome home, Carl. Glad to be back. You haven't forgotten about us, have you, boy? Hell no, Officer Tampenny. I was just wondering what took you all so long. In Grand Theft Auto San Andreas, you play as Carl C.J. Johnson, who returns to Los Santos after the death of his mother to restore his old gang, the Grove Street families, back to power.
Trust me, this is helping to restore the Grove Street families back to power. <laughs> Pretty sure. Anyway, when you first arrive back in LS, you are but a lowly scrub with very little in the way of money, and even less in the way of personal style, clad as you are in blue jeans, a white tank top, and an uninspired haircut. Luckily, the second mission in the game helps you out with that last problem, as your buddy Ryder takes you on an excursion to get a haircut and buy some pizza from a local pizza place. Hey man, what you strapped for? Man, some pizza place keeps paying over our hit up, man. This is beautiful. Teach the owner a lesson. But what happens if you already spent all of your money on, for example, a really cool pair of pants? Good news for you, Rockstar predicted your profligate ways and if you turn up at the barber's flat broke, the game will spot you $50 for a basic level haircut. No jerry curl for you though, GTA San Andreas isn't made of money. The same is true for the pizza. When you wander into the pizza restaurant, you'll notice that the long-suffering GTA San Andreas has reached into its pocket again and coughed up an extra $2 for you to buy dinner. Have a nice, cheesy day. Or maybe it was the pizza restaurant itself that took pity on me and helped me out. Wow, I sure hope the game gives me an opportunity to repay their kindness later on. Give up the money. This will wait. Ryder, not this again. Ah, right. Grand Theft Auto. I forgot. We've spoken before on this channel about how it is generally unwise to go around shooting computers until they explode, both in real life and in GoldenEye for the N64. Specifically, we've spoken about Facility, the second level of that venerable game, where you can carelessly blow up a computer used to remotely open a vital door, making the mission now impossible to complete. Or so we thought, because it turns out that GoldenEye actually has an extremely low opinion of us and thought we would probably manage to do something this stupid. And as a result, it included a helping hand to let us extract ourselves from this self-inflicted sticky situation. If you do end up destroying this terminal, either on purpose or through some overzealous spraying and praying, you can just hang out by the console for long enough that a scientist from the very end of the level will have to answer the call of nature, and he too is carrying an Access All Areas keycard ready to be swiped. Wait. Handy! Although the way GoldenEye is fixing all my problems for me, I might just stay here a little while longer and see if Sean Bean blows himself up. That would save me a lot of hassle. When IDOS Montreal's cerebral cyberpunky action RPG Deus Ex Human Revolution first came out, we were told there was no wrong way to play it. You could upgrade the cybernetic augmentations of your character Adam Jensen however you wanted, tailoring a build to your particular playstyle, so that if you wanted a stealthy, smart hacker who could infiltrate buildings like a ghost, you could do that. Access granted. And if you wanted a one-man wrecking crew with knife arms and a spine full of bombs, you could do that too. Last warning. The problem was, when faced with such a choice, a lot of players put all their eggs in one cyber basket, creating nerdy computer science majors who could hack the hell out of any computer and use pheromones to subtly manipulate conversations, but who were as useless in a firefight as a chocolate teapot. This proved to be a significant drawback, as to progress past the game's first proper level, players had to win a boss fight against the formidable Barrett, a guy who put all his upgrade points into having a minigun for an arm. As such, when Deus Ex Human Revolution was re-released for the Wii U, IDOS stepped in to save players from themselves by tweaking the boss battles so that they could now be defeated by nerdy Adam Jensen's who couldn't hit water if they fell out of a boat. Yes, you still had to kill the bosses, but at least now you could defeat them in the same style that you played the rest of the game. That first battle against Barrett, for example, included new vents for you to crawl around in, out of sight, as well as hackable gun turrets that you could use against him. The later fight against Yelena Fedorova, on the other hand, now lets you activate a poison gas dispersal system that you can use to your advantage. 
Well, it was either that or hope that players learned how to shoot straight. Honestly, I think they made the right call. I never wanted to be a demon, nor all this waiting around, all the riddles. It's no life. Demon doors are a pretty standard way of guarding anything in Fable's Kingdom of Albion. Most don't require a key to open, but rather you must complete a challenge set by the door itself. I only open to those who know my name. If you know it, find and hit the magic stones to spell it out. The Forgotten Keep Demon Door in Fable 2, for example, requires you to kick a chicken at it if you want it to open, while the Desolate Abbey Demon Door in Fable says it will only open to men of the world, which means you need to go away and have sex ten times. Then it gives you a pimp hat. Hey, it was a different time in... 2004? Jesus. One door that does require keys, however, is the one found in Fable The Lost Chapters in Necropolis, which is guarding a legendary weapon called the Bereaver. The usual way to open this chest is to surrender all your silver keys, which are usually used for opening silver key chests, and can be found pretty much everywhere in Albion as you go about your business. Oh, if only I'd been born a silver key chest. I just love those little silver keys. So shiny. If, however, you have somehow managed to acquire zero silver keys, something that is pretty much only possible by actively avoiding them, then you're stuck, right? You have no way of opening this tantalising demon door. Luckily for you, Fable is here to begrudgingly sort your mess out for you, and if you have zero silver keys, which again, takes some doing, the door will just swing open anyway, although not before it roasts you for being such a weirdo. How in Scorm's name? all this way without a single silver key. Well, a deal is a deal. But why do I always have to meet the freaks? How dare you talk to me like that? I'm a man of the world. I should come back with my pimp hat on. Oh hey, didn't see you there. I'm just playing a game competently. Uh, no reason, not trying to counteract that whole thing at the start of the video, which was just clips of us being bad at games. Just, you know, playing playing a game, Jedi Survivor. Just playing it normally, the way I normally play it, competently. Uh, so thanks for watching this video. Uh, do click on one of the links on screen right now if you want to watch more list videos from Outside Xbox or from our sister channel, Outside Extra. Uh, check out either of those videos for a good time on youtube.com and we will see you next time. Thanks for watching. Oh, for God's sake, Cal! Not again.